Hello. Have you ever wanted to build a game like Hyperlight Drifter, Zelda, or Death Store? These games, along with a bunch of other ones, are popular 2D, often indie games, all from the top-down perspective. Each of these games have playable characters that can move in four or eight directions, sometimes freeform, any degree of direction across 360 degrees, and there's a huge range of games built like this across genres. I'm going to show you one way to build a game like this, something similar to Zelda A Link to the Past, that style of character and movement and animations. We're going to be building something like this. We've got a handful of little bugs floating around, or moss, butterflies, um, whatever they are. We've got our main character, little bunny dude, drawing shadows underneath all of them. And then we've got four directional movement for our main character. Step number one, new game. So as usual, how we start all game maker projects, clearing everything out of the asset browser except rooms. I renamed the default room to room zero and we'll want a bootstrapper object. Bootstrapper is the very first code that runs when the game opens up. We can use it to set up windows, cameras, other objects, global variables, macros, anything that we want to use to bootstrap the game, hence the name. In the case of this game, I'm just going to make a create script and I want to do two things. I want to show a debug overlay. It shows stats about your game like frames per second. And also by default, the game window will be black like this with our sprites. I think they'll look a little bit nicer on a white background. So I'm going to grab the background layer of the game which by default is called background. If I open up room zero, we have a few different sections. One being layers. We have a layer called instances and a layer called background. You can see down here, we could go in and manually change that color, but it is useful sometimes to change the color via code. So I'm grabbing that background layer, dumping it into a variable, and then I can use a function called layer background blend, which takes in that layer object and then takes in a color. So we'll use the built-in white color. Back into our room, I like to drop objects like this that don't actually display on the screen anywhere. There's helper manager objects. I always like to drop them at zero, zero. Let's run the game. There we go. Debug overlay up here in the top left, white background. Next up, let's get something actually showing up on the screen. I'm going to use the Sprite Lands asset pack by Cup Nubel. You can get it on itch. In the pack, you get this main bunny character. You also get a bunch of different objects. We're really just going to be pulling two things from this. If you download that pack, you'll see these folders. If you open up characters, open up that basic character sprite sheet. So we've got 16 sprites laid out in rows of four. So essentially what we're looking at here is the first two columns are our idle animations for down, up, left, and right. And then our last two columns are our walking animations for down, up, left, and right. Then also in the sprite pack, we have an objects folder. And there we have a bunch of things. If we open up the basic grass biome things one, you'll see things naturally. I'm really looking at this bug guy here. So we're just going to be pulling that one frame out. So we've got the sheets. How do we actually get them in the game? A brand new object that's going to be empty. And then I'm also going to go in and make a sprite. When we double click on our sprite here, it opens up our sprite viewer, our sprite inspector in the workspace. Naturally, there's nothing in here yet. Over here on the left hand, I can go ahead and hit edit image. And it's going to open up our image editor, which of course we could go in and our own image here if we'd like to, but we have our own. So in the top bar, I'm going to click on image. I'm going to come down and do import strip image. Then I'm going to grab our bug sprite sheet. And then now we need to isolate just this one. So you see, we have these white, this white box here. This is highlighting the section of the sprite sheet that's going to get imported. So for example, if I move this around using something like horizontal pixel offset shifts that over. If I use it vertical, it shifts it down. So basically what I want to do here is just that one bug in this case, nothing too fancy here. So with horizontal, line it up with the left side of the sprite. With vertical, line it up with the top of the sprite and then drop the width and height down so that it matches up with the right and bottom sides. Just like that, simple enough. Hit convert. I'm going to ask if we want to replace the current lovely drawing that we put in here. Yes. And that's it. Got a new sprite. Close out the tab, open up our bug object and drag our sprite onto our object bug. If we open back up our room, we can actually 
put our bug in the scene. Let's drop one in there. If I hold control and use the mouse wheel, I can zoom in on it. I'm gonna hold shift and drag and make it a little bit bigger. With the way our room set up by default here, this is gonna render our window with these exact proportions. So essentially the size of these sprites here are exactly proportional to how big the window is going to be. So for example, if I hit F5, that bug you can see is pretty much exactly how it looks in the editor in proportion to the room. So let's just throw some of these guys around the room. I'm using control C, control V. Cool. Okay. Let's get our bunny character in. So we're going to do something very similar. We are first going to make an object, call it bunny or whatever you want, player and a sprite. We get that same sort of window here in our workspace. Come over, edit image, not going to make our own top bar image, import strip image. And this time we're going to go into that character folder from our sprites and grab the basic character sprite sheet, import that in. It's actually defaulting some of the information from our last import. So I'm going to zero out our offsets. In this case, we want all of these sprites. I'm going to bump up the number of frames because we know that there's 16 frames in this image, right? There's 16 sprites, four by four. We also know that there are four per row, frames per row. So bump that over to four. And then I, I actually don't know the exact width of each sprite. So I'm just gonna bump this up until it reaches the right side of the screen. Simple enough. And then do the same thing with height. Okay, and that's it. We can actually just convert this. It's gonna grab all of these images and stick them into one single sprite, which then you can actually play as an animation. So it's it has stacked all of these animations together. So it's playing the idle animations and the walk animations all at the same time. It's also going very fast. So we can bump frames per second down to five. So you can see that a little bit better. Still a little bit hard to tell what's going on, but that's all right. So that's fine for now. Let's do the same thing as we did with our bug and drop our bunny sprite into our bunny object and then jump back into our room and drop our bunny object into the room. Again, it's gonna be small. So let's click on him, shift, click the corner of the object, drag him up so that he's a little bit more visible. Now, if you play the game, you can see what's going to happen. It might not be quite what you expect. So it's playing all the animations automatically by default. Not quite what we want. Let's look at how we can fix that. Jump back into our workspace, clean up a bit. And on our bunny object here under events, I'm going to add a new event for create. So every time the bunny gets created, when the game boots up, it's going to run this code and we have a few variables that are on all objects across the game. One of them being image index. So image index is gonna be the specific frame of the sprite. So for now, since we're not dealing with animations quite yet, I'm just gonna assign our image index to zero. So that's gonna stick it on the first frame and leave it there. And then to actually prevent the animation from looping, I'm going to take this image speed variable and set it to false. It's not going to loop. So let's hit F5, run our game, and our bunny should just be static. There he is in all of his static glory. Okay, so what's next? How about we get him moving around? So if we jump back into the workspace, look at our bunny events, we can add another event here for step. So something that the step event is useful for is we can check for input from the user. So we have some useful functions that we can use in the step event. Um, one being keyboard check. So keyboard check is a function that takes in a key and then checks if it's being held down right now. So for this game, for now, let's do, um, we can just use the arrow keys. So I can make a variable called press left, meaning is the left key pressed down? And I can use that keyboard check function and then I can pass in a variable called BK virtual key left, which if you're on a computer, it's going to map to your left button. Then let's do that for the rest of our keys. Okay. So we have all of those to show you what these actually look like. We can print them out, show debug message, 
we could say left and then we could print out our press left variable. Um, it's not a string, so we have to wrap it in the string function to convert it to a string. And then the plus is shoving these two strings together to call concatenation. So if we run F5, it's always zero. Now, if I hold down the left key, it's gonna go to one. If I let off, it goes back to zero. That's all these are. It's true or false value, zero or one value based off of is the button held or is it not? So now that we have our keys, we want to do something when they're pressed, right? So one way we could do this is we could come in and say, if press left, then we want to move the character some amount of value in a direction on the X axis. And then we could do that for all of these, right? So if we want to go right, we're adding to the X value. If we want to go up, we're subtracting from the Y value. And if we want to go down, we're adding to the Y value. So for reference, the coordinate system in GameMaker starts from the top left. Zero, zero is the top left. As you add to X, it scrolls across the screen to your right. As you add Y, it scrolls down. Try all of our arrow keys, right? Moving around, looks good. One helpful thing here is we're just randomly adding 10 here. I'm going to actually store a variable on our bunny object called move speed and set that to 10. And then within our step function, we can reference move speed. So our character is always moving at the same speed in every direction. We're not having to adjust it in four different places here. We just come into move speed and we change the speed. So for example, maybe slow them down a little bit. It might be moving a little bit fast. There we go, a little bit slower. Now there's another way we can do this. Instead of checking and having these four if statements, we can also find the essentially the movement vector, meaning if you think about where the character's at on the center of the screen, we can try to find an X vector and a Y vector. Sounds complicated, but it's very easy. It just means the X vector is either a negative one, a zero, or a one. If it's a negative one, we want them to move to the left. If it's zero, we want them to stay still. And if it's a one, we want them to move towards the right. So I can make a variable called X direction. I can subtract pressed right and pressed left. So why does that work? So think about what pressed right and pressed left look like. They again are zero or one values. Run through the use cases, right? If a player is holding just the right key, it's gonna be one. And they're not holding the left key, so pressed left is gonna be zero. So in that case, we're gonna get one, which means we want the character code to the right, which makes sense, because the player is holding the right key. Now, if, if the player is holding just the left key, then pressed right is gonna be zero. Pressed left is gonna be one, and that's gonna give us negative one, and that's perfect because negative one maps to left. Player's holding just the left key, so we want them to go in that direction. Now, what if they hold none? Easy scenario, zero minus zero is zero, and that's the case we don't want them to do anything. And if they're holding both keys, then that's one minus one, which is also zero. So if they're trying to hold both keys down, it's just gonna freeze them because it doesn't really make sense, so it's fine, it's also idling. So that's our x direction or our x vector. So now how do we map that to pixels that we want them to move in each direction? So remember, this is gonna be either a negative one, a zero, or a one. Let's call it our x delta is the amount of pixels that we actually want them to move. Well, we should just be able to do x direction times our move speed. So in this case, if they're trying to go left and it's negative one, then that's gonna be negative one times our move speed, which is six right now. So it's gonna move them negative six pixels. If it's zero, it's gonna be zero times six, which is zero, it's gonna move them zero pixels. If it's one, it's gonna move them one times six, which is six pixels. I hope that makes sense. And then all we have to do is add that to our X value. So it's x equals x plus x delta. Let's try that out and see if we have horizontal movement working. So I'm gonna hold the left key, works there. I'm gonna hold the right key, works there. If I hold both, goes nowhere. It's great. So let's simplify this even a little bit more. So let's take our x value and do x equals x plus x direction times the move speed, which is our x delta, and then get rid of our x delta. If you want, you can simplify this even more and put our pressed right and our pressed left within X direction and just have a single line here. But I'm gonna leave it like this 
my mind is just a little bit more explicit about what's going on. So then we can do our Y direction. Then we can do our Y direction. So same thing. So we're going to do our pressed down minus our pressed up. And we're going to update our Y with our Y direction times our move speed. Run the game and everything is working as expected again. Okay, let's deal with the animations for our bunny next. So you saw our bunny sprite. So we have a sprite with 16 separate frames. We have our idle front, our front walk between frame two and three, our up idle, up walk, left idle, left walk, right idle, right walk, and that's it. So there's a couple of ways that we could handle this. One way is we could split out all of these animations into different sprites. So we could have a front idle sprite, up idle sprite, left idle sprite, right idle sprite, left walk sprite, right walk sprite, up walk sprite, down walk sprite. So we could, we could have eight separate sprites for the bunny object. For the sake of pure laziness on this video, I'm gonna show you another way to do it by leaving everything in a single sprite. We need to identify which frames relate to which animation. We're gonna create a new struct where our keys are gonna be the state, left, right, up, and down for our different walk states. Then all of these are going to have frames for idle. We're looking at frame zero and frame one. Okay, so we have all of our frames associated with each animation. So now I'm gonna create a function called set animation, which is gonna take in a state. And then what we want this function to do is to set the current animation that we're gonna be playing. For now, let's just make this function set animation frame. So I'm gonna use another instance variable called animation frames, which is gonna represent the current animation frames for this object. And then I'm gonna use this function called variable struct get, which takes in a struct like animations. It takes in a key like state, and then it returns back the struct. So for example, if we run set animation, and we pass in idling, it's gonna call this function, it's gonna pass in state as idling, it's gonna call variable struct get, it's gonna look in this animation struct for the keyword idling, and then it's gonna give me back this struct. So at this point, since I have that struct, I can then just say dot frames. So now that's it, we're just gonna leave that just like this. So we have the ability to set the animation. This is still isn't gonna work though because our bunny object is gonna have the proper animation frames, which we can see by logging it. So we run our game and we see that the current animation frames are zero and one, but obviously our bunny is not doing anything. So there's a couple of reasons for that. One reason is we still are just locking image index and image speed, which we can get rid of completely now. This still is not gonna work. As you'll see, it's gonna loop through everything. And it's because we aren't actually using animation frames anywhere. We're setting our animation frames on the bunny, but we aren't doing anything with it. We actually need a new draw event so that we can control how the bunny is getting drawn. So the first thing that we need in our draw event is draw self. So we also want to add in some sort of control on image index. So one way that we could go about this is we could create a new function called bound that takes in an integer like image index and then a list of bounds so that it forces the image index to fall within the bounds of that array. So I know that's confusing to hear. So let's, let's write this bound function and see what it would look like. So it's gonna take in that index, and then it's gonna take in a set of bounds. So let's think about what we want this to do before we even write the code. So, so we can write out some examples here. So if we call the bound function and we pass in a two, let's say that in the current animation cycle that 
our bunny of draw event is trying to draw frame number two, but our bounds are three to four. So when it tries to run that second frame, we actually want it to be forced into the bounds. We would actually want this to return the number three. If we run bound with the number five and the bounds are from three to seven, then five is fine. We just let it continue and then it's gonna draw frame five, then it's gonna try to draw frame six, then it's gonna try to draw frame seven. And then when it tries to get to frame eight and the bounds are the same, we want it to actually loop back around to three. And then it's gonna, again, it's constantly going in this loop, these frames. It's gonna try to draw frame three, then four, five, six, seven. It's gonna try to do eight again, and it's gonna loop back to three. So then we're just looping within these bounds. We're looping three to seven, three to seven, three to seven. It just really boils down to two conditions, right? If the index is less than the bottom side of the bounds, or if the index is greater than the top end of the bounds, then we wanna kick them back down to the bottom end of the bounds. It's like we were talking about, it's gonna loop up to seven, it's gonna hit eight, we wanna kick them back down. Otherwise, like in our condition with five, bound it to three to seven, just leave it alone. Just return the index right back. So in this case, we're just gonna return that five right back. Let's run that and see what happens. So this is interesting that this still is not working. So let's look at why that happens. I'm gonna do show debug message on image index and see what it's actually trying to do. So it's bound it between zero and one. So what it's doing is you'll see it's actually printing out these floating point numbers. So it's not just pure integers. It's not frame zero and then frame one. It's actually frame zero and then it's running 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, all the way up to one. So that's that's the time that it takes to play the animation of the zeroth frame. Then from one to two, it's running the next frame. So we're actually bounding it by the point it hits one, the number one. That's the very first point of that frame. So it's not getting a chance to actually play it. So all we need to do here is add plus one to the top end of the bound. So what we're gonna do is, instead of saying if it's greater than one, lock it back down, we can say if it's greater than, let's do 0 0.99, so that it runs all the way up to 1.99. So then at the second it hits two, which is the beginning of the next frame, then it locks it back down. Let's see what this does. There we go. There's our idle animation. Get rid of that debug message, don't need it anymore. Let's do one other piece of cleanup here. So I don't like the fact that that bound function is directly in our bunny object. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So I'm actually gonna make a new script for it. I'm just gonna call it script math. It's only gonna be one function in there anyway. And I'm gonna take our bound function and dump it over into our math script, close that out. And then our draw function looks nice and clean. And now, we can just set animations easy enough. We're already, we've got all of our key presses. We're moving the bunny in the proper direction. So let's just, let's add some checks for which direction the player is trying to go and then change the animation based on that. Is there a helicopter? Wait for the helicopter. Okay, so we can just check our X directions, which we already have. We already have our direction vectors which if you remember, x direction is negative one, zero, or one. Negative one goes to the left, zero stays still, one goes to the right. So we can check that. So we can say if x direction equals negative one, then we want to set our animation to left. And then we're gonna do this for every direction. And in the case of no direction vectors at all, assuming that, meaning that they're both zero, then we're gonna go back to idling. Let's see what that looks like. Hit left, playing the left animation. Hit right, that looks good. Hit up, it's not playing the up animation. If we hit down, it's playing the up animation. So these two are flipped. So easy enough. I just flipped the vector variables here. Try that again. Okay, up and down are fixed now. It's good. Here's a challenge that you can do on your own. So there are also idle animations in each direction, but the way that we wrote this code, it just defaults back to the front facing idle animation. Ideally, if you press the up key last, you would still be facing up. 
you wouldn't jump back down to facing forward. So, and then same with left and right directions. So see if you can do that yourself. Post in the comments if you can and the solution that you use to do it. So that's actually it for simple four directional movement. But I want to add a couple other things into the world to make the world feel just a little bit more alive. So jumping back into the character draw function, the bunny draw function, we already are drawing ourselves, right? We're so how do we actually draw a shadow in a game? So there are a handful of draw functions already built in, right? Buttons, arrows, circles, ellipse, which is exactly what we want. And you'll see down here at the bottom, it takes in two sets of X, Y coordinates, X1, Y1, X2, Y2. And then if it's an outline or if it's actually filled in, so that last parameter is true or false. So let's draw that and see what it looks like. So we don't see anything. Let's try, let's try setting the draw color on this and set it to black and see if that's our problem. So there's our circle, very tiny up here in the left-hand corner. So our initial problem is that it was defaulting to the color of white on a white background. So once we set it to black, we can see it. So what's happening here is it's drawing a point at 20, 20 pixels, and it's drawing another point at 40, 40 pixels. And then it's automatically creating a circle between those two points. So let's, let's try to draw it based off of our character itself. So we can use the X, Y value of our character. And then let's just uh, pick another point a little bit further out from X, Y and see what that looks like. Okay, so this is interesting. And it's because the sprite of our bunny, if you remember, had a bunch of white space around it. So it's actually drawing it at the top left point of our sprite. And then it's pushing X out 20 and then Y down 40 and then drawing that ellipse. So first, let's fix that X, Y coordinate. If we go back into workspace and open up our bunny sprite, you'll see all of that white space that I'm talking about. So here's our player character, but here's the actual box, this thin white line that surrounds our character. And here's where our X, Y, X, y value lives, where this little crosshair is up here. So instead of it being up there, we can actually drag this around. And I just want to drag it down to kind of the center middle of our character. Right about there is good. So let's try to run that again. And that should be our actual X, Y value. There we go. You can see it also actually moved our bunny character up a little bit because we shifted where, where its home is, where its X, Y is. Easy way we can fix that is we can go back in our room editor and then just drop him back into the middle, run our game again. And then he's back into the middle of the screen and his shadow is drawing underneath him. Let's actually make this shadow look a little bit better. Think about what our shadow width and height should look like. So let's try out a couple different values. So for now, let's say the width is 50 and the height is 30. So what we can do here is instead of adding 20 to our X value, you can actually add our shadow width. And then for our Y, we can add our shadow height. Okay, not too bad. So now the next thing that we need to do is, it's obviously not in the middle of the character. The start of the shadow is in the middle of the character, but we want the shadow to actually be centered with the middle of the character. So what we need to do is shift the starting point, the X coordinate, back to half of the width of that bunny character. So one way we can do that is we can actually just subtract the width of the shadow. An effect that it's gonna have though is actually gonna double the shadow width. So instead I'm gonna drop our shadow width back down to 30, subtract it so that it shifts over, and there we go. Centered pretty close with our bunny. You can play around with these numbers yourself and see where exactly you want the shadow to be positioned or not. And then the next step here is the shadow is really obvious. So as we can set our alpha, meaning our opacity. So I'm gonna set it down low, like 0 0.2, so that it's transparent. We don't need it to be a solid black figure on the screen. It looks goofy. There we go, looking pretty good. One final thing that I wanna do is just shift the Y value up just a little bit. So I just wanna shift it up 
maybe 20 pixels or so, so that it is actually underneath the feet of our character. It looks like it's floating out in front of him right now. There we go. And that's pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's a nice start. Kind of make our character fit into the world a little bit. Looks like he's not just floating out in space. Now we're actually going to do something similar with the bug too. So I'm going to open up our bug object. And we're actually not doing anything with our bug object yet. It's just completely sitting there. So I'm going to add in a draw event. I'm going to draw self. Then we can start thinking about what our bug object is going to do. So I do want shadows on it, but I also want it to do a little bit of a float. Again, we're trying to just make it feel a little bit more alive. So here's one way that we can do that. So I'm going to define something called a float factor. Essentially, I'm using a sine wave and I'm using the current time of the game um, so that as time continues to progress, it feeds that into the sine wave function, which is going to make a wave. It's going to go up and down. Feel free to play around with these two constants and get something that you like. I just experimented a little bit and I like the way that these look. And then I'm going to add that float factor to Y over time. So let's run that. And now we should have all of our bugs kind of, yep, just doing a little bob, doing a little float up and down. Perfect. Then we can draw shadows for them as well. So we're going to do something very similar that we did with the other, with the bunny. Um, set the color, set the alpha. I'm going to draw an ellipse. I'm going to draw it at the XY value of the bug. I'm going to make a shadow width and a shadow height. I don't want it to be an outline. In this case, I'm actually not going to move the XY value. I'm going to show you another way that you could do this. So the bug will actually still have its XY value in the top left, but we have access to this thing called sprite width. It's the width of the entire sprite. So I can actually just add half of that value so that it shifts the X value up to the middle of the sprite. On Y, I can add the sprite height so that it sticks to the bottom of the sprite. And then we're gonna do the same thing for our ending point. So we do have the shadow in the middle of the bug the way that we want it, but we have the same problem that we did before. So we need to actually shift this over. So on our X, we're adding half the value, but then we're gonna subtract back out the shadow width so that it pulls it back over to the left. There we go, looks pretty good. Now our next problem is, does it make any sense that the shadows are moving up and down with the bugs? Obviously they should be stuck to the floor. So one way we could do that, which is relatively straightforward, is we can go into the create functions and I'm gonna store the original X and the original Y values. What we need to do is we're adding this float factor so we can get the distance from the ground by looking at our original Y value and subtracting out our current Y value. So that's the distance that our bug is sitting, floating above what we're calling the ground. Let's go in and replace our X and Y with our original X and our original Y. Then for our Y coordinates, we need to actually subtract out that float factor. We don't want to take into account at all. We just want to stick to that original Y value, right? There we go. Shadows are sticking to the ground, what we're calling the ground. And then I'm also going to add just a little bit of extra buffer here. I'm just going to call it an extra 30 pixels on the Y value so that they're not sitting so close to the bugs. I just want them to get pulled down a little bit so they look like they're actually floating above the ground. And then one final thing here is I want those shadows to shrink and grow based off of how far we think that the bug is from the ground. So I can do something like this. I can get the distance from the ground based off of the distance between where the bug originally spawned and its new Y value because it's going to be floating up and down. Then I can use that distance to kind of adjust the width of the shadow. If I add the distance from the ground, as the bug gets further away from the ground, the shadow is going to get bigger, which makes sense, right? It's getting closer to the sun, so the shadow gets bigger. So we can start with that. And then as it goes down, it's going to get smaller. 
can get closer to the original size of the bug. Okay, there we go. So, but it's a little bit too dramatic. So I'm gonna cut everything into one fourth and see what that looks like. That's perfect. That looks great. Just a subtle little shadow up and down. And now it actually looks like all of these things kind of fit together in the world a little bit more than they did before. And that's it. That's one way to do four directional movement in a 2D game. Code is going to be in the description. Check it out on GitHub. Play around with it. Build on top of it. Hopefully it helps you a little bit. Let me know how it goes. And that's all I got. See ya.